the show with your friend and mine. So tell me, Dr. Squee, who's it gonna be this time? We like to hear you talk, but we love to hear you listen. And if you are not subscribed, you won't know what you're missing. So welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. We're going to welcome our next uh, Doctor Who companion. He's from the 1996 Doctor Who TV movie, along with some other wonderful projects. Please welcome to the uh, Squeefest fourth, Yiji Cho. How are you doing, Yiji? Not too bad at all, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, four hours in, so, so these are the easy hours for me. Okay. <laughs> I've got what? down only 20 to go. What am I complaining about? <laughs> And what time is it in the UK right now? We're just coming up on six. We've just gone six o'clock. Six p.m. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What time is it for you? Is it about eleven? Ten a.m. Yeah. Ten a.m. Not too bad. I was only an hour. Out. Luckily, I wasn't when I sent you the invite. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, I know, like, we're, we're going to get into your acting, of course, but you've also done a little bit of work behind the scenes, which are behind the camera, which I thought was fantastic. So you've uh, done a bit of directing uh, on the short butterflies and production design on the peace tree. How's a few stepping behind the camera? I really, really enjoy it. Actually, it, it probably, if my life had went a different way, I would have pursued uh, being a director instead. Um, I, you know, I, I might, I might not, it might not be a common thing for actors to to say or acknowledge or have this um, perception. I mean, maybe maybe it's only my um, per perspective, but actors are not really the storytellers. You know, like it's the producers and the directors who are telling the story. The actors are kind of like the furniture. Like we're we're part of we're in the story, right? Like we're you know, and and don't get me wrong, that's that's a big part of the story. Like the the people in it. Um, but we're not, you know, I mean, we, there's a, there's a, I think a, I don't know, a mischaracterization of actors as storytellers. I, I, I feel like it's, 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 uh, it's a little bit different than that. And that's not to downplay actors or the role that we, we have. Uh, but, but I think had I, had I a different sort of pathway in life, I would have explored being um, a producer or a director. I think there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Yeah, um, the other thing which I found was wonderful, uh, I found this out, actually, I, you, you won't remember, but uh, I met you many moons ago at, uh, on the Sci-Fi Weekenders, and you played us a few tunes. Uh, this was, I, I believe it may have still been up in Wales at the time, because it's moved a couple of times since. Yeah, I think I do recall, actually, because looking at your face, I, I know that I've seen it before, so. Uh, it might have been slightly more bloated at the time, I've lost a bit of weight <laughs> since then, but apart from that, it's, it's r r roughly the same face, <laughs> and perhaps a few more wrinkles over the years, but apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you played for us McLean Park, I seem to remember, so oh, uh, this music okay. always been a bit of a uh, passion for you. Yeah, music's always been. I was in a band in high school, and when our when we had kids, my wife and I sort of you know assigned instruments to them, and they've both been involved in music since they were at, at a very young age. And McLean Park was sort of something that I was um, that I did just just on a whim uh, to, to to celebrate the the park close to our house um, where our kids have grown up, you know, along with their friends and everything that, that um, in the neighborhood. Uh, we used to throw this sort of like harvest festival kind of thing every September. We'd have this uh, outdoor little festival that happened with the community, you know, a, a pie contest and, you know, a bunch of hay in the, in the in the middle of the field where kids would kind of roll around. And I don't know, it was just one of those very wholesome, great things about, um, you know, being a parent and, and, you know, being next to this park. So the song just kind of sprouted from that. And um, and it kind of it kind of was the beginning of of this this practice I've had now of of you know occasionally writing song and recording it and maybe sometimes sticking it on iTunes or maybe not maybe sometimes collaborating with other um, musicians to kind of record it um, record various tracks and put things together and the the whole point of it really was to kind of show or demonstrate to our kids that nowadays you can make anything you want like the yeah. internet. For all the terrible things that the internet has, you know, gotten us into or whatever, there's also been 
some really wonderful things. There's also opportunities we have now that we've never had before. And one of those is the democratization of content, right? Web two is, is everyone pouring content onto the internet and you can do it. Anyone, anyone can do it. So, you know, I mean, the end result of that, uh, both, both of our kids have written songs like originals and, you know, recorded them and put them into various places. And it's, you know, they get to make things. I mean, I think that's that's a great outcome. <laughs> yeah, there is um, such a purity to be able to. There's no go gatekeepers anymore. Anyone can just try and do anything. And even though it's tougher to get noted, more tough than ever to get noticed in such a, a white noise of, of content, if sure. you're lucky, you might just get to the top uh, through doing it. I mean, the fact is that you're empowered to do it, right? Like there were gatekeepers, yeah. there, the, the, the gatekeeper idea before, it's like you never even had a chance to make the thing. You couldn't yes. go and really, you know, producing your own felt like, you know, the short that we made, this was just back in the mid knots or the early knots. I think it was 2002 or something like that, where I shot a short film with a friend of mine. And it's quite a bit of money to do that, right? Like even on a shoestring budget, even with a small crew, you've got to pay for fit. We, we, we used to have to pay for film, rent the equipment. You know, you had to get a location, you got permits, um, get food for everybody at the very least, if you, even if you're not paying for people. Uh, you have to post-process the film. You have to pay for an editing suite. All of these things uh, it, that you can pretty much now do with a phone and computer at home, right? Like everybody's got what it takes to do it now. And to a pretty high level of quality, if you're, you know, or even the lighting, this LED lights now, you can, you know, it, yes. used to be that, it, it used to be you had to have this massive generator and 10K, you know, lamp on a stand in order to get the kind of light that you need now they have these helium i just worked on a show uh just recently and they have ellie they had these led lights um mounted inside a helium balloon and you float this helium balloon above your scene it lights everything and you don't have to you have nothing to set up except for this thing that came in a bag that you fill with some helium i mean it's i mean just every, it's so so much more accessible now right I, i'm not saying that everybody can go out and get themselves a helium uh uh, balloon to, to light up a scene but i mean it's a heck of a lot easier than it used to be is what i'm saying <laughs> yeah, and we have to be careful we're running out the helium i hear so you know. yeah right <laughs> um getting onto the acting side of it of course uh, so one of the kind of like interesting quirks is that when you were doing doctor who it was alongside sliders as one of the other possible shows of getting picked up and that ended up being picked up and that was a show you set yourself had worked on for a few episodes mm. Um, were you aware of that at the time? And, uh, you know, what do you remember of working in Sliders? That's a great show. I, yeah, I wasn't aware that there actually to be probably maybe more honest than I <laughs> should be. I, I wasn't aware of a lot of things back then. I was like maybe blissfully or maybe not uh, ignorant of a lot of things. I, I And I was, I was unaware of the fact that Sliders and the, the Doctor Who were sort of up, quote unquote, against each other in terms of getting getting uh, getting a, a long running series on yeah. on Fox or whatever it was. Um, that that's a, a situation that I had no no knowledge about. Um, but yeah, Sliders was fun. I, I also was a little bit sort of uh, you know unaware of the uh, of the people I was working with on that show. Like the um, so I mean, of course, I'd seen Stand by Me when I was growing up because everybody in my age you know did, uh, and um, uh, and when I when I got onto the show, I was like maybe vaguely, vaguely as in very vaguely aware of of the people that were on it, but it really didn't like dawn on me that that Jerry O'Connor was in was in uh, was in Stand by Me. Like I didn't really put two and two together. Um, and this happens to me often. I'll work on a show and like not really realize who I'm sitting next to, and then people ask me afterwards, like, "Oh, did you talk to that person? Did you get their autograph or something?" I was like, um, "No, actually, I didn't. I don't think I realized who they were when when they were here." It's more of stereo comedy. You've got uh, John Rhys Davies there, who done yeah, yeah. at that stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, so slider. Yeah, I mean, it was fun, and but I just well, I don't think I was. I mean, the, the, the character was a, was, a, was a bit of a, a smaller role, and, and that's fine. Might have been able to make something more of it. I don't think I was in the headspace to, you know, kind of put anything to, towards that. But again, it wasn't my choice. So, you know, so, so, so be it. There, there, are, some, there are some actors who, who I think are better at and put more focus into, like, 
turning turning every part like that into into sort of as much opportunity as as they can and somehow they have a way of doing that and and they're very good at it and or, or better than i am um and so kudos to them but i just it's not something i was ever really good at um i mean do, do you think that was helpful though because it, it did, did seem certainly I, I loved seeing you in interviews around the time of dog too because you were just so happy to be there and just so mm -hmm. gleeful i think that kind of living in the moment uh probably did you service in another way that like you weren't thinking of oh i'm working alongside this person working on this person i'm doing this piece do you think that's a good point actually um yeah i i, I appreciate that thanks for that uh looking back on it for sure there's a certain yeah there was a certain way of moving through things that you know if you didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to your next gig or or whatever it, it kind of allowed you to have a certain kind of life and and um and, you know, and, and for all the ups and downs and good things and bad things that have happened in my life, I certainly don't regret where I am now. I, you know, I, I wouldn't trade where I am now for practically anything. Well, anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for the world, actually. So um, so I, I wouldn't go back and, and change how I did things back then, um, you know, at, at, at the risk of, of, you know, doing the the uh, the, the time travel uh thing where you mess up your your current timeline because you you know fiddled with something in the past like i wouldn't do that <laughs> you watch you watched and appeared in enough sci-fi to know that doesn't work out <laughs> yeah 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 don't mess around with history yeah um and again just uh, maybe if you've got any stories on these or if, if they're ones you don't remember just tell me and we'll, we'll skip them past but uh highlander the tv show mm. Mm. Highlander was cool. I I uh, I didn't spend very much time on on Highlander, but uh, but it was neat to be part of the franchise. You know, like and and that that happens a lot in Vancouver, where they're they're essentially you know everybody's cast. All the all the main people are cast, and then they come and shoot in Vancouver, and they're like, oh well, you know, for this episode, we need this person to kind of pop in there for a couple lines here and there, or maybe they're a guest guest star on the show, but then they kind of disappear next episode. And uh, and that's per per perfectly fine. That is the um, that's the kind of career that we choose when we we want to be, you know, a, a career actor in in, in Vancouver or, or 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 you know, a lot of places in Canada are, are like that. Like if you, if you base yourself in Toronto or Montreal, it's somewhat similar as well. So so yeah um yeah but but Highlander was fun. Um yeah it was neat working with uh, with the with the people there and I just spent a day there and and didn't get to play with any swords unfortunately, uh, but. Maybe next time. <laughs> uh, the Outer Limits. Now, I thought this was one of the most uh, uh, successful and best done revivals of, of one of those shows. I love 90s Outer Limits. Uh, do you remember the premise of the episode you were in? Yeah, it was, uh, we, there were, um, there were, uh, so I'm, I don't know if I have to care about spoilers because it's, an, it's a very, very old show. And I don't okay, know. Okay. Spoiler alerts. We're going to spoil something from 95. Yeah. I think yeah, we're spoiler, good. Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> it's not even, yeah, it's probably not, not even a concern. Just <laughs> no, no, it's fair. It's fair. So it's very uh, thoughtful of you. <laughs> um, so, so basically the, the, uh, there are, there are a bunch of us in, in international sort of different places around the world living in these bunkers. Uh, because um, you know, there's been uh, there's been an alien invasion. Essentially, there's like it's like this apocalyptic thing where we're we're in our bunkers and we're we're trying to. Um, and, and the episode was called Dead Man's Switch. So basically, what what I, I guess sort of the premise is that if we're we're there to be no one left out of all of us that are we're stationed in these bunkers around the world. If 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 none of us. Um, uh, let me try to recall the mechanism. It was something like if none of us, you know, survived, then this like nuclear detonation would happen, and we'd 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 you know blow up the Earth in order to wipe out the the aliens that that invaded or something like that. And the ensuing sort of drama and uh, and sort of horror show things that happened um, subsequent to that. It's it's amazing. I love these programs. It's like only with something like uh, Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits could you have such a, a bonkers concept, and it just works somehow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a fun show. No, it was it was actually quite. Uh, yeah, it was quite quite a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah, it was the first. It was one of the. Can't remember if it was. No, it wasn't the first time that I had perished. Um, but but it was one of one of the the you know half a dozen or a dozen times that I'd perished on scene. I was like gassed. In that one, like toxic gas of some kind, like filled my bunker and I strangled to death. <laughs> wow. Uh, 
Well, I, I mean, you did pop up on a lot of these uh, sci-fis here and there. Is that something you're interested in? Is, or are these just the parts which came along? At the time? It's a bit of both. So I'm interested in sci-fi myself. I, I like to read. So I've read. I've read a bunch of different sci-fi with with our kids, like you know, um, Hitchhiker's Guide, of course, and and a lot of things that actually kind of maybe bleed into into fantasy, right? Sci-fi fantasy. If you if you want to glom those things together, I know they're very different, of course, but. If you were to glom them together, um, I, 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 I like those things. Uh, and and um, and so it's it's partly that. It's partly I think like a lot of sci-fi requires like sort of techno babble, and techno babble is something that I seem kind of inclined to do. I suppose I, I work in technology, um, so that that's maybe you know part of it. And then um, and then it's also partly because in Vancouver we we have shot we have had a lot of sci-fi shows base themselves in Vancouver. So just sort of the natural progression from that is that a lot of the roles I get are are on sci-fi shows. So like Battlestar yeah. Galactica and and uh, I I don't know. There's a I can't remember them all. There's there's been a lot. <laughs> well, I was I was going to ask you about the Stargates next. So you were Tex on a couple of the Stargate shows. So on uh, SG One and Atlantis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stargate's a Stargate was really fun. It was going for a long time, so it was like a Vancouver staple to work on on, mm. on Stargate, right? And, and Stargate Atlantis, and and the people on there are really really great. Um, uh, 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 Peter DeLuise, who um, first I think we I first um, found out about him on Twenty One Jump Street. Um, and he was he worked on that show with um, with uh, um, this is new Johnny with Depp? names. Sorry, Johnny Depp was the Johnny Depp, the exactly. yeah, yeah, Johnny Depp of, of, of in, incredible fame. And of course, I knew his name. I just it just eluded me for a moment. But thank thanks for helping me there. Um, so yeah, so 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 Peter DeLuise would go around with with a handful of loonies, which is like the $1 coin, which I don't think it actually exists in Canada anymore. Um, but anyway, we, we had this $1 coin with a, with an, with an engraving of, of the, of a, of a loon. And so we all called it the loony and he'd walk around with these things and just kind of like randomly kind of like hand them to you. Like he would just walk, walk up to you and just be like, here's a loony. <laughs> and, and he would do that with like just random people around the crew. It was just an, ex it was just something to talk about. It was an excuse to just get to know people that he wouldn't normally have a lot of contact with, I think, on the crew, which is really cool, right? Like it's a it's a it's a neat thing to do. It's just a bit of fun, basically. And and I think, but that was like a small example of how 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 he seemed to do things, which is just make make something kind of a little bit different, a little bit fun for the for the crew and and cast. So yeah, there was some some good people there. Also Amanda Tapping, um, she was on those shows uh, as an actor, but like subsequently. Um, you know, has been has been doing some some more directing and and stuff, and I worked with her on 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 the Travelers, um, and she's a great director. So uh, yeah, just wonderful people. Yeah. And so a lot of really what makes a show right, like or like anything, is is the people involved, and it may or may not play out on screen. Like so, shows are successful or not successful based on a variety of things that are maybe unrelated to to what I'm talking about. But the experience of working on a show is certainly certainly has to do with the, the quality of people on it and i and i enjoyed working on stargates also their sets so i mean they didn't have they had a little bit of an unfair advantage over over doctor who for example because they had this they, they had a cnc machine I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with what that is but it's like a computer operated sort of um thing like machine to to like mill things and and drill stuff and make basically making it was all it's it like it's it's like a 3D printing version one, right? Um, uh, it's like a massive router with a, with a computer attached to it, and uh, and they they yeah they used that thing to create um, some really intricate sets, like all of those things you see in the background with like the actual Stargate and and all of the the sort of um, the, the the textured sort of panels that you see in the background. It just created this great atmosphere and feel to the show that I think was part of the reason why it was successful and also why it was so fun to work on. <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite funny. Um, one of the shows we've got coming up is a Due South program, which I do. And on Due South, Amanda Tapping, which you mentioned there, had actually played uh, someone who's working on an airbase where there might have been some UFOs going on. So she, I feel like she almost played that character already. She had the lead in ready for when she did Stargate. Yep, yep. Um, but anyway, I get off on the tangent. You were you mentioning uh, Bell Star Galactica then, and you talk about your gorgeous sets. Like the the mm. look and feel of that show was so it's felt so immersive. Is yeah. the way I put it. Uh, yeah. yeah. What, what was it like stepping onto that? 
Yeah, yeah, similar kind of feel. Um, I, I, I'm not as familiar with like how they did it per se. I only did one episode of, of that one, um, as opposed to Stargate. I got to hang around a little bit longer, but um, but yeah, it was it was uh, yeah, it was cool working with Lucy Lawless. I think that was an episode that she was on for some reason. I can't remember why. Uh, and um, and the sets were yeah had that had that kind of feel that that sort of um, very sort of descriptive sci-fi kind of. Um, atmosphere to it it's nice Brilliant. a bit darker that show i feel like but okay um so we've got a continuum i was going to ask you on about next oh. so that was um the very high concept of reality kind of changing around it uh, in that show. yeah yeah that one um yeah continuum yeah the part that i played in that was it was interesting because it was more um it wasn't really like sci-fi related per se it wasn't doing a tech part it wasn't on it wasn't on a ship you know it was like it was just you know in in this reality where where um the character was like i think um somewhat political or like an, an activist doing it was he was involved in some kind of protest or something or like a rebellion or something like that and and um and so the whole scene the, the whole scene felt just like you know a scene in dystopian earth somewhere or whatever but yeah in the context of the show there's there's you know all this sci-fi going on and um yeah so it was it was interesting somebody i knew somebody i subsequently worked with quite closely actually was a was a regular was a lead on continuum steven steven lobo um yeah i can't remember the, the name, name of his character but yeah anyway also good people on that show <laughs> excellent so uh, finally before we get into the dog two all the, the 100 ah which, uh, yeah yeah, it's 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 kind of like a similar sci sci-fi uh, wonders, but but from the point of view of kind of these, this teenage crew, which end up getting uh, stranded. Yeah, yeah, which made it yeah. wildly popular, or like it, it contributed to that. And and yeah, I mean, it was uh, I was just there for the last episode or two, uh, and and was like a random, you know, kind of techie person, uh, sort of operator of this sort of alien sort of technology thing. And it was on a ship. Great, nice, also really nice sets. Um, I think I took some pictures. I don't think I'm allowed to share them, but but they were, um, yeah. And uh, as, as it happens, one of the leads on there, Shannon um, Shannon Cook uh, Cook Chun, he I just worked with him on a on a on a different film or whatever, and he's he's a really really swell swell guy, like a really good guy, solid solid dude. Uh, so yeah, I mean again it it was enjoyable because because the people were were, were great to work with right so <laughs> excellent uh now let, let's talk a little bit about dr who so sure. um do you remember when you first heard about the project had you heard about it before you kind of were auditioning or when uh well about? i mean I, I i knew what doctor who was because when i was growing up i i was like what they call the latchkey kid i'd i'd, I'd get go you know take take the bus home i i was um, for better or for worse, I, I didn't enjoy this, uh, but again, I wouldn't change it, I, I don't think. Um, I, I went to school in a different, I went to school in Vancouver proper and I lived in a municipality. It was like an hour bus ride kind of thing, right? So um, so I I take 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 the bus home, let myself in. Parents were working hard. Um, they were they were immigrants and they, um, you know, they they needed to uh, to do what they needed to do to kind of like support us here and 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 keep us you know um you know enable all the things that they enabled so so um so yeah so they were working and so i kind of just like i i'd flip the tv on and that would just be going um and i you know i'd have a little table and i'd do some homework and i'd grab myself a snack maybe or something and i'd, I'd be like that for like i don't know seven hours uh, until it was time for bed, and then and then I'd hear the lock kind of like clicking on the front door, and I'd quickly switch everything off and like dart off into the bed and pretend like I was sleeping the whole time. And my parents would come in and be like, "Okay, so he's he's asleep as he, as he should be." But um, but unbeknownst to 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 anyone else, I've been watching TV the entire time, and 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 you know, and, and not I wouldn't necessarily be just sort of totally engrossed in it. So uh, so for example, uh, Doctor Who's one of those shows that would come on. You know, we had limited choices back then, right? You had a few channels to flick around between. And Doctor Who would come on and I'd hear the music. And it was Tom Baker, I think, that was primarily that pri primarily the doctor that I that I actually remember seeing. And and but I couldn't tell you a single plot line because it was just, you know, I'm just scribbling away at my homework or 
playing chess with my little chess computer or whatever. And, uh, and, and shows are parading themselves in the background of my periphery or whatever. So I, I had some awareness of what Doctor Who was when the audition came through. But um, Trish Robinson is no longer with us, which is really sad. She was a wonderful casting director. Uh, sent it, you know, uh, uh, sent out the um, the breakdown, and my 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 agent, um, who, who I'm still with today, uh, sent in the uh, my submission, and and she brought me in, and uh, she had previously cast me on a show called Madison, which is like this uh, high school teen drama kind of thing uh, that that we shot here in Vancouver. What I did a couple of seasons of that, so yeah, she she brought me in for the Doctor Who thing, and yeah, the girl. Wow rest is history I guess and how long uh, after you, you know, then did you start filming yeah good question so when was the i think it was relatively quick if i recall correctly and that's a big if the auditions were in November or December, and we started filming in February. And when you began on the filming, uh, I mean, in the meantime, had you looked up any more stuff about Dog 2, or did you just want to treat the material as it was? I, I didn't do a lot of research, partly because I was a little bit concerned about knowing too much about the doctor before I met him. Right. Um, because Ch Ch Chang Lee has this thing, like, I mean, he's completely unaware of what's going on with this doctor person. Right. So, so yeah. right. And, 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 and it's like that until he discovers through being, you know, thrown, you know, through, through the TARDIS, well, the first opening of the TARDIS doors or whatever, that's really when he kind of discovers everything. And I didn't want to have too much of that, be, it's really hard to unlearn well for me and, and and especially since i was young at the time and you know not particularly skilled in the acting thing um i i didn't i i, I wanted to be careful to not um make it harder for myself right because because had i learned a lot about doctor who i think it would have been a little bit harder for me to be so sort of green to it on on screen if yeah you and the entrance which you did have at the time uh, there was this uh, big shootout which due to at the time there being a real life shooting got mm. cut down which is completely understandable and, and the right move to do but it sort of suddenly meant that you were there with this group of uh, gang of, of youths who were threatening you and then suddenly they disappeared as soon as the TARDIS arrived mm. um, yeah can you tell us a bit about shooting that what sounds like quite a an action scene yeah, so they did. Um, they they um, they locked the camera off, which is what they do when they're going to do special effects like that. And they had this false wall in this uh, in this alleyway in Chinatown. And actually, in my book, Time and Spaces or whatever, I have a picture of like where, what what that alleyway looks like today, and what it um, and and where the where the um, where the false wall was at the time, because I, I had took some photos when I was on set way, way back when. You can't do that these days, but back then there was no restriction on that. So I had my camera with me, and I, I kind of took some pictures of the TARDIS with the with the wall, and and um, and yeah. So what happens is they they lock off the camera and they shoot some footage of the wall with no TARDIS there. Then they shoot footage of the um, of uh, and and they'll and they would with the same locked camera they'd have me wander in there and and and. Um, and, you know, do this thing where, you know, I'm standing by the wall and like, oh, no, I'm dead because I'm like, you know, caught in front of this wall. And then they bring in the TARDIS. And uh, and because the camera is locked, um, you can edit it in such a way that it looks like the TARDIS just kind of like appeared there. Uh, and then um, and then they had the special effects go off the squibs on, on the TARDIS, on, on, on the TARDIS, which had to do with like the gang members like firing their weapons at this thing. And then. And then ostensibly what happens is that they get freaked out by the fact that there's this thing that just materialized in the middle of the air and they get into their car and drive away. I don't know that there was ever a cut of them actually driving away or, or running away in, in that made it into the movie. I think you allude to the fact that yeah. you don't really know what happened to them. There might have been some sound effect they tried to layer in there to be like them, you know, squealing off the, 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 the tires of the car, like screeching away. I, I, I can't remember. Um, but anyways... Uh, um, 
that that was not not before of course they they um they they sh you know have been shooting up the tardis and then and then sylvester mccoy walks out of it and gets shot right so um so yeah there was uh it was a bit of an action scene i i guess yeah there was definitely an action component to it it, it just seemed like um again we completely understandable why they made this cut but it just went from you're facing them down and then there's basically one shot which goes into the doctor hmm. and they've disappeared <laughs> it was just it, it was just, just really strange when you're watching it back yeah. yeah yeah what are you gonna do when life gets in the way yeah uh <laughs> the other thing which uh, yeah so so you've got the script that you know you've started filming it what were your first impressions of chang lee when you were kind of getting the, the part ready um yeah good question i mean the it 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 was fairly it, it, it wasn't the first time i'd played a role like that and It, it, it was um I, I had some familiarity with with um you know char characters um of of that ilk right like so so you know like you know cr criminal type characters or like you know gang member type thing it was what it wasn't the first time i had to wield a weapon in a in a show uh so so it kind of yeah i mean it was i felt like it was something that i could do right like I'd, I'd done it before and was going to do it again with other shows and um and, and had some some familiarity there so so yeah I, I i um yeah i didn't really know what to make of it really i mean he the the, the neat thing i think is that he gets his he gets uh, a, a character arc per se right like he has this sort of roller coaster ride where he um befriends the master and and kind of works with the master for a while and then at the end kind of you know kind of goes goes another way and ends up you know, ends up being sort of a companion to the Doctor for a very, very, very short period of time. They travel in the TARDIS for, you know, a brief little jaunt, um, and, and then he's off. But he's definitely a different person at the end than he is at the beginning, which is always a an interesting thing to get to play. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's this sort of aloof sort of quality about him that that um, that sticks around, right? And so... Yeah. Um, I think that was uh, I've I've learned since you know from Philip Siegel and and uh, uh, you know in in various sit, sitting on panels with him at conventions and stuff like that that you know part part of part of why they they wanted me for the role you know despite me being late to the audition was that they they were looking for someone who had this kind of like aloof like I don't really care kind of quality you know like I would you know and and uh, and I guess at the time. You know, I I, bet I demonstrated that to them, so um, so that's something that I feel like kind of carried through with the character uh, throughout, um, and yet he got to go through some changes as well. So yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, because something I did want to talk about, which you kind of like, um, you set the scene for this question very nicely. I was going to ask you about Eric Roberts refers to you as the Asian child <laughs> very dramatically in this, mm. and uh, something which I know kind of a lot of um, I don't know what the, the correct term would be but asian actors certainly mm. seem to uh have a lot of uh, lazy parts especially around the 80s and 90s they weren't necessarily the best researched or best kind of written parts mm. uh you seem to have avoided that uh but like the asian child is perhaps a, little, a small kind of like less than ideal you probably wouldn't use that now but uh, that now. Well, how do you think you avoided kind of some of those lazier parts that some other people had to take because that's what mm. was an offer at the time Oh, well, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I think I don't know if I did avoid it, um, but um... <laughs> oh, oh, tell us about some of them. Is the other the other way of wording that? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, so it was a very different time in the '90s in terms of being an actor who was, yeah. you know, a visible, visibly sort of culturally diverse or whatever, right? Um, the the and and I mean, it's it's still to a certain degree like that today, but it's much much different um so so i i don't know if you've seen the, there there was a there was a, a documentary or it might have been just like a little youtube snippet or whatever um that 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 kind of demonstrated you know the uh the it it it, it tried it basically tried to like uh concatenate together like the sum total of all of the speaking lines of of a certain um uh ethnic group or whatever in in like major motion pictures or whatever for that year 
And it was something that could be squeezed into like a, I can't remember exactly, but it was something that could be squeezed into a 10 minute YouTube video. Like it was a very, you know, it was just boom, 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 like, it, you know, uh, and, and, um, and it was stuff like that, other analysis like that, that kind of said, okay, look, like what, what's the percentage in North America? Like, I, I get it if you're, if you're, you know, if you're in Wales and you're making a movie about whales and you're, you might, you might not have a whole bunch of Asian people. I've been to Wales. Um, there's not a whole ton of, of, of Asian looking folks there. And so, you know, if that's what it is, then, then, then yeah, I could, I could understand. You wouldn't probably have a lot of Asian folks in that. It's true to what's there in North America though. We've, we've got a real mix of people like in, in the cities at least. Right. And, yeah. um, and, 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 and that's not represented in our media, in the media that gets created in North America. It's, it's not even remotely represented to the same proportions as you would find in, po in the population. Like you walk around the streets of Vancouver or L.A. or New York or whatever, you're going to see a mix of people that you do not see in the media. You just don't. Right. Even even now. Now is much better. Don't get me wrong. It's many orders of magnitude better now. But in the 90s and 80s, what you saw on TV and, and, and movies and, and such just didn't look anything I, like I just it. looked at that and I wasn't trying to claim it's perfect now I know it's far from it just better <laughs> yeah oh much better, better. necessarily good but it's yeah no, it is much better it's it's much better and I don't and and I'm not saying any of this out of any sort of like spite or whatever either like I'm not I'm not one of those people who would stand up on a soapbox and go hey I should have more opportunity the world is what it is and you make of it what you what what it gives you right so um but but I, I bring up the point because um you know just to illustrate the change that has happened um Back at, at the time, you would there was never, ever, ever, like ever, a lead character written for it, for an for an Asian guy. Some you you might there was Bruce Lee was an exception, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't Bruce Lee, <laughs> um, nor could I do any of the things that Bruce Lee could do. So nobody was asking me to do that. Yeah, you you could forgive them for for making Bruce Lee do martial arts you know because he already because he did martial arts but it was when they, they expected every other oriental actor to be able to do it right 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 yeah yeah um so so yeah so so you wouldn't so i i pretty much had to quickly come to terms with the fact that okay i'm, I'm not going to get a lead role in a in a in a in a tv or, or or movie thing so that's fine so set that aside all right so what's what's left over um, they they occasionally made roles for Asian characters, such as in Doctor Who and, and some of the other things that I've done. And they would specify like, oh, this person's Asian. So, okay, great. So those are opportunities. Going. And, and when those came up, uh, you know, there was a relative benefit because along with not having very many Asian parts in, in the industry, there were, weren't very many, many Asian actors. So I could probably count on my fingers, maybe fingers and toes. The number of Asian actors there were in the early 90s in Vancouver, right? So if they were casting in Vancouver and I was going out to it, I'd see the same people over and over again. And it was either going to be him or me or that guy or me. Like it was very easy, you know, it's very easy to know. Like one of us in the room right now, we're getting this part, right? Like, yeah. so, so there's that advantage. But it was still few and far between where they wrote those roles. The vast majority of the things I would go out for and bless my agent for this, for submitting me is ones they would call open ethnicity. So they would have no particular... Um, specification on what ethnicity they would want for this character is just a character in the show and by virtue of being unspecified like that the writer hasn't really paid all that much attention to it as you just mentioned right like by definition the writer hasn't specified certain things about this character they haven't really thought about the character is there for some reason other than being fully fleshed out by the writer right yeah um uh, they're there because they need to expound some part of the story or move some plot line ahead or they're there to fill in some, you know, and this is not a bad thing. Every story needs those characters, right? Like, so I'm not, you know, I'm not digging on the writers. They're not going to put full, full, full attention into the backstory of every single little walk on part in every single script. They're just not going to do that. So that's fine. Um, but th those are the roles that you would you would get because they're open ethnicity because all of the other roles were, you know, Caucasian male. Um, and if you weren't that, you weren't getting called, Right. So, yeah. um, so that's, that's how it goes. That's how you get. And so, um, so you just, you know, those are the roles that you get and you, you do them and, or, or not do them. And, and, you know, thus life proceeds, I guess. <laughs> I did love it when, um, uh, it was Neil Gaiman who was talking about the recent casting of the Sandman mm. and he purposely, um, despecified a lot of parts to say, it's like, look, is there a reason why this has to be a white male or a, a female or like one particular thing? 
or could yeah. we just see everyone in the world for this and just get the best person for it? And and that, see, and that's di that's different, right? So if a writer puts puts a, a lot of thought into the background of a character, and maybe they do have a specific ethnicity in mind, but then yeah. uh, or or maybe they don't, right? But but they've put they've you know they've created a character that's pivotal to the story in some way. So they put whatever work that they needed to put into to make a character pivotal for the story. They've done that, and now you've got a character that's pivotal, and then they go and cast a thing and say, you know what? We don't need this character to be any particular ethnicity, so let's just open it up to everybody. That's a different thing. That's great. That's that's a new thing. <laughs> um, it didn't used to happen very much, um, but it's happening now, and that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's quite a funny thing. I find I've done I've done a limited amount of writing myself, but I've had a few short stories published, and what I find is it's like automatically when I'm when a, a character isn't jumping out, I sort of will purposefully kind of change it from male to female or change mm. it. To this and it just seems to pop more, you know, it's like this. Interesting. You know, if you always go for straight white males, that there, there's been a lot of stories written in that genre, let's just say. It's, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a side thing. Uh, and actually, but just before we forget, you did mention that uh, if people donated £20, you would do a, a discount on your book. Yes, that's right. I need to set up the discount code. Let's do that right now. Um, what, I don't know. What discount, and then I'll just announce it. Yeah. What's the what's a good? I guess we could use Shelter Squee. It's right there on the screen. Well, I was thinking if people uh, donate and then they just send me like a thing going, I donated in your name, then yeah. I'll, I can check it against the donation and forward it onto yourself. Perfect. Let's uh, do that. Sounds what percentage great. do you want to give discount just so people know? Oh, um, let's go with uh, let's go with half off. Never done a half off thing before. This is a brand new thing. Um, right. It literally has never happened before. But this this is a uh, this is a um, a good cause. Uh, I heard Nicola talking about it before. Um, you know, before I, I I hopped on or whatever, and um, and just you know reading up about it too. It's definitely something I feel like um, you know could use the support. So yeah, let's do it that way. You know, twenty pounds to shelter squee and uh, to to shelter, and um, and we'll do half off the online edition of the book. Amazing. What I'll say is, if uh, is it okay for a week after this broadcast? Because some yeah. people catch up on late. Brilliant. Yeah. For a week after this, if you go to justgiving.com slash shelter squee, if you can afford to donate now, donate now, please. We we love donations on the night just because it. If nothing else, it makes for more dramatic TV, but also it helps those people who are struggling uh, with issues around housing where everyone's going through a cost of living crisis in the UK, certainly, and I, I understand many other countries are, are affected as well. Uh, so please, like, uh, you know, uh, I'm just going to quickly address something because there was something which um, First Lady of Ukraine said, which is a very powerful, important statement that she said, whereas your uh, count of pennies, we're count, counting the death toll or words to that effect. However, there are some people who will not survive this. I, there's no like nice way of saying this. There's some people who will be so poor because they can't heat or they can't feed people that it is life and death to some people. So as much as I don't want to take anything away from the Ukrainian appeal, which is wonderful, there are people who are suffering who will die because they can't afford to heat their houses this winter. So please give whatever you can. I, again, I don't say that to take away anything from her, but I think we have to see there is a real life effect to to people being homeless and people not being able to afford eating. So um, anyway, that being said, we'll get back to you, sir. So thank you very much. That's very generous of you. Um, speaking of some of the people you're working with, so Eric Roberts, uh, I, I've come to really love it. Like I wasn't sure at the time, but it's the biggest performance of the master you're ever going to get. What mm -hmm. like to work alongside? Because you work very closely with him during the shoot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there was, uh, I, I, I felt like it was a, very positive experience. I, I know that not, not not everybody has the same experience, you know, on a set or or of a person or or, or whatever. But I'm just going to speak from my own personal experience. I, I got a lot out of it, and I felt like it was positive overall. There was a bit of so um, the the on screen relationship between the master and Chang Li, for example, has a certain dynamic, right? There was this sort of like dark, kind of twisted, sort of parental kind of thing, like you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit. A little bit sick in the head kind of like parent kind of child sort of thing happening right like asian child and 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 twisted time lord parent kind of thing and and so and and um and 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 you know i i it felt as though there was some uh the 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 off-screen relationship had some qualities that were like that right like 
whether that was manufactured because uh, Eric was was doing a method acting kind of thing where, you know, he's kind of creating this dynamic off screen that kind of would play on screen or or whether it's because, you know, he's that kind of person and everybody has that sort of experience with him. I, I don't I don't know. But but for whatever reason, um, the off screen dynamic fed the on screen dynamic. And and I think that was perfectly fine. Um, and, and, and he had, you know, he made some efforts to, uh, kind of help me out in, in some ways and like provide some coaching or whatever, uh, which is also a part of that dynamic, right? The, the sort of like parent child kind of dynamic. So, you know, in a weird twisted kind of way, I, I, I feel like, um, working with Eric was exactly what it needed to be. Yeah. And do uh... Like where the uh, master was such a manipulator, did you talk about those scenes and did or did you just play the reality of the moment? We didn't collaborate in that sort of more um, kind of peer peer collaboration kind of thing that you might do with another actor on a in, in a different scenario. So so we never kind of sat around and like chatted about the dynamics, right? It wasn't like that per se. It was more like um, you know the dynamic was there. And we would, you know, do the scene together and, and it would just happen that way, right? Uh, um, I don't recall doing a whole lot of, like, line reading um, re re rehearsals with, with Eric. Like, oftentimes, you know, be, you'll be sitting in the makeup trailer with another actor and you know, if you have a scene together that's coming up, you'll start running lines. Didn't really do that with Eric. That, that sort of thing wasn't, wasn't happening. Uh, and, and that's not, you know, I don't say that in a critical way. Just That's just not how it was. So, um, you know, what ended up happening is that we showed up on set and Eric would start doing the lines the way that he did them. And I would try my best to just react to that or just, you know, be okay with that. Just, just hang out with that kind of thing. Um, and I think for the most part it worked, right? So, but, um, you know, there's definitely some things I would change about my performance. How do I, would I go back and do it again? Like, you know, ca you know, caveat with the whole, you know, messing around with history thing, right? But, um but there are things, but there's always, you know, in any work that you do, I mean, the same thing happens in software engineering. Um, I look back at like code that I've written a year ago and I want to change it. Right. So, you know, there's luckily with software, you can go, you can do that. There's version control. You can go back and edit something and change it and push up a new version with, with film and TV. You don't get that chance. <laughs> it's you do it or you, um, or you do, or that's it. Uh, before I go into my next question, I've just realized I've said to people to email and the email address is Dr. Squee, don't ignore the dot at the front, Squee at gmail.com uh, if you want to take advantage of that 50% off uh, uh, UG's book and I will forward on everything to UG so we can sort that out. We'll work it out. But just email to there and we'll figure out the rest. So <laughs> there will be a code, I know, at some point. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so for the next question, so the other co-stars there, so... Um, uh, Daphne Ashbrook, who, even though she perhaps wasn't as known a name at the time, she had been in every single TV show you care to mention, uh, a fantastic female character actor, really. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what would she like to work alongside? Daphne's a light. She really is. I mean, every time you see her, she's just so full of love and, and like, it's just um, very, it's, um, it, it, and it's been, it's been like you know with all the conventions and everything too it's it's the same way she's just a very loving nice person like just really a joy to be around so really supportive and cares about the people that she's with and and um yeah it's uh it's kind of amazing actually and i, I can see how her um some of those anxieties that you see in her character or whatever you can kind of they they kind of they're you know they're kind of they're a part of her right like she brought she brought that from somewhere and and it's from somewhere honest for sure yeah and paul mcgann um such mm. an uh, amazing and storied actor even uh, you know at that point and he's just gone yeah. on to more things since uh yeah what was he like as the lead because of course everything on set revolves around the, the person on the top of the call sheet yeah for sure Oh, I mean, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I think he made a great doctor. He's he's wonderful to work with. He has these stories. You know, we've had a chance to kind of hang out and, you know, I, in the many years after the show, too, like at hotels or airports or something. And he'll he's got these stories about, you know, English theater and, and working in the industry and the people that he's met. And I mean, and the way that he conducts himself, you know, he's he's uh, it's, he's almost like a walking. Um, he's like a, a real life poet. You know, like, it's like everything that comes out of his mouth is poetry. <laughs> Oops. 
I lost audio. Wait, hello? Pardon me, sorry. I, I clicked the button because one of my dogs was snoring. Oh. <laughs> it sounded like the, the noise of the TARDIS from your from the TV movie just going on the background. <laughs> <But anyway>. mm. <laughs> what I was asking was, sorry, um, with Paul McGann, I was just saying, I think with his accent as well, it's kind of very lilting. I think that helps the effect. Yeah, yeah, that helps for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, but but like, I mean, the, the the also the content of what he what he you know communicates or whatever, and the the kind of style of you know how how he sits in his chair and the way that he, I don't know, I don't know something about Paul. It's just so it's very um, it's it's compelling and it's it's impressive. Like if I had to think of one word about Paul, I think it would be like impressive. And I don't think he would like that either. Like, I don't think he goes out to try to impress anybody. No, uh, he's very and so modest. I don't, I don't want to, you know. No, I, I agree with you, but I think he's just very modest. He seems to mm. not like the accolades. He just wants to get on with the work. Right, right. He's very modest, very humble. He just kind of wants to do his thing. He's kind of, you know, pragmatic. And and yeah, as, as, as I was trying to say, like he certainly doesn't go out to impress anybody, but the end effect of how he is, is that it just impresses me. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I did want to talk about, we, we mentioned the uh, exterior of the TARDIS landing, but that interior set, a mm. million dollars, I understand it cost. And I think it's one of the things which actually they did take forward when they did the rebooted 2005 Doctor Who, mm. was to, I think the look of that console room did inspire the kind of next look. That whole, well, so first off, um, you know, we, uh, Phil Collinson, who's one of the producers of the new series, right, in 2005, um, yep. you know, very much involved with this series or whatever, um, at the 50th anniversary, or maybe it was the, maybe, no, I think it was the 50th anniversary um, in, in, in England. Um, I'm pretty sure it was at that, at one of the conventions. Was it the one One Direction turned up at and had the most awful, awkward TV link up? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I can't, I, um, there was the 50th anniversary celebration that was at the, you know, the massive, the, it was like 25,000 people at this huge um, convention center thing or whatever in England in 2013. Um, yeah. But but it might, but this, but this event, might, this, this thing I'm about to relay might, might have happened at a different convention. But Phil, Phil Collinson um, took Daphne and I aside one time and we just sat in some, ca some random cafe somewhere or whatever. And he's just like, hey, I want to have a chat with you. And um, proceeded to just out of the blue... Um, Give us this this gift that I think if you got Daphne in the same room with me that we would agree like or, or if you if you talk to her separately I think that she would recall this and probably have a similar um, recollection of it that he he proceeded to let us know about all of the things in the 1996 movie that they used as a sort of stepping stone to bring to 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 create the new series from from what would have been like this unfathomable kind of gap between the classic series and the new one right like so so yeah. i mean you know ob from obvious things like you know the 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 doctor being you know ha having you know being able to be in intimate relationships for example like the kiss right um to yeah to the style of the of the tardis um all there was a lot of a lot of um elements that he said they would not have been able to make that jump and they would not have been able to make the, the two, two, 2005 series the, the way that it was had there not been a 96 movie. And he, he, basically, he basically like attested to us that the 96 movie has its sort of, it, it's a milestone in the history of the show that was, that's required. It, it, was, it was canon in the way that they, they needed that to make the 2005 series. Now, I mean, I'm paraphrasing him, and um, but I don't think I'm mischaracterizing what he's saying to us. Like, again, ask Daph Daphne. She was the other person that was there. Like, he was impressing upon us that the show was needed to be there. And I have to admit, I didn't walk around in my head thinking that before having this conversation with Phil Collinson. I wasn't like, you know, full of myself in, in the head thinking like, yeah, the 96 show was an important and critical milestone in Doctor Who history and led to the creation of the 2005 series. No, I wasn't thinking that at all. But he gave us this gift, and I think what he was trying to relay is that is that we don't need to regret whatever did or didn't come from the 96 movie if we appreciate the fact that Doctor Who came back in 2005 the way that it did, right? Yeah, um, it showed, like, there was, over here, it got 9.9 um, .9 million viewers, I believe it was, just shy of 10 million, mm. and that was huge ratings, but just the BBC weren't ready to spend money on sci-fi at that time. Right. It, right. Just, it took it took sci-fi, I think, it's almost like science fiction caught up with Doctor Who, because <laughs> it 
it became back in vogue again. And right. then the BBC were willing to make that journey a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I think just from the UK viewing figures, it would make it because in America, it went up against Roseanne's final season, I believe it yeah. was. Yeah. And so many heavy hitters, it was sort of destined for failure pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, there was a final, there was a championship sporting event too. I can't remember if it was like the Super Bowl or something. Something was, uh, something was all, it was, it was, yeah, it was kind of doomed to failure in, in, Nor in North America. Also, and to be totally, you know, frank, I think the process of trying to adopt, I, I think having so many cooks in the kitchen, you know, you had, you had Universal, you had Fox um, and, and the BBC. And I think that the idea that we could um, repackage Doctor Who in such a way that we could introduce new audiences to it in America and at the same time be in service of um, old audiences that were already familiar with it. I think that's a inherently difficult thing to do, right? That's how do you how do you serve many masters that way? How, how can you, how, you know, there's there's no recipe for success, but the recipe for failure is to try to please everybody. And, and I think in a way, you know, we had to try to do that. I mean, many moons ago when I spoke to Daphne Ashbrook and we talked about the kiss, which, you know, just so many people threw their toys at the pram belt. I, I think it might have gone down a little better, but, but the way they filmed it, especially the second kiss at the end, they had fireworks going out, this huge stirring music. I don't think Doctor Who fans were ready for a Hollywood big screen kiss like that. You know, right. if you made it a bit more intimate, as I think the first kiss in it was. Yeah, I think it might have gone down a bit better, but like you say, yeah. probably trying to service the American and British audience at once. This is the thing, culturally speaking, um, the U.S. like American culture, American media, and and British culture and, and Canadian culture, um, they are different. I mean, they're they're very similar in certain ways. Certainly, we share a language. There's a lot of similarities, but there's some things that are just a bit different. Like, and it kind of shows up in the way um, in the way you know people talk in the, the, the sentence structures that we use, we learn as an actor early on that you can't speak like a Canadian on American shows. You have to speak like an American. And when you speak like an American, your sentences end uh, with a period and you make statements. You don't ask questions like Canadians do, right? Like we're, we're not, you know, um, you know, I just did it. I just did it right then. Like, right, right. Is, it, is that true? Is that right? I don't want to offend. Like, I just, I'm just proposing an idea here. Like that's, that's the Canadian version. And the American version is like, this is how it is. Like there's, there's no question. You know, um, you're either you're either on my side, you either understand what I'm saying or there's something wrong with you. I'm telling you, this is how it is. And I'm not saying they all think that I'm not saying they look down on us or anything like that. I'm just saying that's the style of language they use. And so culturally speaking, if you're going to have a kiss, especially one at the end of a movie uh, in, in a, an American produced movie, you're going to have fireworks like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I get it was New Year. I, I get why the fireworks are there, but yeah. it just it just looked. A little overblown for I think the British taste in for sure for that sure. kind yeah. of thing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just quickly before we end, uh, please do give a shout out to your book. Uh, as mentioned, if you donate to justgiving.com slash shelter squee and email doctor squee at gmail.com, D O C T O R, so full word doctor, uh, we'll uh, give you 50% off uh, the book. So tell us quickly about that. Yeah. So there's an odd, like um, in, 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 uh, in, the for the 20th anniversary there was a a a book that i had released with milk publishing in the uk and it's a photography book and has all this original photography from when i was on set uh back in back in 96 because back then you could take photos there was no restrictions against that and so that stuff got unearthed in a box that was in our garage by my wife and there's there's like original documents from the ser from the from the show like the the original script the original location um schedule basically telling us where and when things happened. And, and I include snippets of that in, in the book. There's scans of these documents in the book. And so we can lay out sort of a chron chronologically and kind of historically accurate way um, these different locations that, that we shot in. And, and there's visual depictions of them. There's like photographs from back then and also how those locations were in 2016 when I went back and kind of re-photographed those, those locations. So that was a physical book. 25th anniversary, 2021, COVID, didn't reproduce a physical book. But I did an online version and I, I recorded a voiceover in my studio and I cut together a bunch of images and things and made these videos. And it's available um, uh, to members of my website. So it's ichito.com slash book. Um, and you can you can join up as a member and you get access to the book there. And again, you know, 20 quid donation to uh, to shelter uh, through through shelter squee and, and an email uh, to to um, to Dr. Squee at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll get I'll get you in there for for half price, which I've never done before. So. 
Thank you very much, EG. It's an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. Please take care. Thanks, you too. Thank you.